Good morning, sorry. <laughs> Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome back to day two of the TRIP Symposium. I hope you enjoyed the reception last night. It was terrific. The food, the wine, and mostly the people, the mingling, the networking, the visiting of the booths of sponsors and exhibitors. I think everyone that I saw last night had a very, very good time. So thank you very much, Idemia, for providing the venue for this excellent networking event. Today, we have an all-day networking coffee located on the fifth floor, just above the entrance to the assembly hall here. It is sponsored today by Regula, and I encourage you to walk up to the fifth floor mezzanine and visit additional sponsors and exhibitors that are, of course, all eager to converse with you about their technologies. And a reminder that we also have an exhibitor on the third floor, just at the foot of the escalators, as you make your way down the building. For, for those who were not with us yesterday, a big welcome. Thank you for being here this morning. And I do have a few of the housekeeping items that I'd like to go over once more with you. Again this year we're making available an application, an app, for the symposium. It allows you to keep abreast of each of the sessions and the speakers and to take full advantage of the networking possibilities offered throughout the week. In fact, you can consider it your official program for the symposium. Very easy to connect to. You connect to the ICAO public Wi-Fi, which is available throughout the building, and you download the app from the Apple Store or the Google Play Store by searching for events at ICAO. Events at ICAO. We also are broadcasting live through live streaming the entire proceedings of the symposium and this is thanks to Secure Report. Secure Report is a, an organization that specializes in live streaming and we're happy to have them provide the service throughout the week. So if colleagues of yours could not attend the symposium, give them a call, give them an, an email. They can tune in to the entire proceedings of the symposium and they can actually watch us live on unitingaviation.com. I'll repeat that, unitingaviation, one word, dot com. Additionally, the SkyLive streaming presentations and recordings of the symposium are available for on-demand viewing as soon as each session is completed. So if you missed one, you'd like to see it over again, you go to unitingaviation.com. The presentations that are available will also be uploaded to the symposium website at the end of each day. Let's see, I think that pretty well covers it. One thing that I'd like to mention is that at the end of most of our sessions, we have a question period where you can put your questions or comments actually to the moderator and the panelists. You can do so by email from your computers or electronic devices. The address changed from yesterday, so I'd like to make sure that you change the address that you will be using to simply tripsymposium at icao.int. 
TRIP Symposium, one word, at ICAO.INT. Finally, of great interest, lunch today will also be offered on the fifth floor where the all-day coffee networking break will be happening. So on the fifth floor, there's an extra island for the lunch. And actually, when you go up there, you'll see the view is magnificent of the, uh, of the building, the entire building. So if it's too crowded downstairs, you can go up to the fifth floor. The view is great. Finally, throughout the symposium, if you have any questions at all, please come down to see our trip team here down at the front row of the hall. We'll be happy to answer all any questions that you might have. So, we're ready now to move on to session two, where we reflect on the importance of innovations in border management. In fact, our guest speakers in yesterday's opening session all alluded to the need for innovating and collaborating in developing new solutions to our common challenges. Our session two panel is composed of representatives of stakeholders and international organizations that will provide updates on the respective initiatives and projects. And the moderator is Sylvain Lefoyer, the Deputy Director, Aviation Security and Facilitation at ICAO. So Sylvain, without further ado, the entire floor is yours. Merci. Thank you, Denis. Good morning, everybody. I'm going to give you a second to put your earpiece on because I'm going to be moderating in French. Voilà, je vous laisse prendre vos écouteurs. Je, j'en profite au passage. I'd like to let you know, as uh, Denis said yesterday, that uh, the symposium has uh, full interpretation services. You see the interpreters at the back of the room, behind the glass, and uh, that way you can speak in any of the six uh, official languages of ICAO, and so I am uh, speaking mine, French. So don't hesitate to uh, speak your own language if it's one of the six uh, UN languages, Arabic, Chinese, uh, Spanish, French, Russian, and English. It's uh, not necessarily uh, very easy for my panelists uh, to keep up with me, but I'll try to go slow. Uh, it's my honor to moderate to this morning's session. So you're going to be hearing me, uh, but you'll also be hearing from the panelists this morning. We're going up to 10.30, and I would like to uh, keep it to 10.30 because uh, one of our panelists, Christopher Wolf, has to go to the airport for an inauguration. As uh, was mentioned yesterday afternoon, the uh, KTGI initiative uh, is uh, launching uh, with the WEF uh, Canada, the Netherlands, and a number of operators. So we want him to uh, get to the airport on time, and we will uh, strictly abide by the schedule. So without further ado, I would like to ask Dr. Christoph Wolf, who is the Director of uh, Mobility in uh, the uh, World Economic Forum, t and invite him to give the views of the WEF on uh, assistance uh, for mobility and uh, supporting throughput of uh, passengers. And uh, they are leading a number of very interesting initiatives that we're following closely in ICAO. Christoph. OK. Good morning, everybody. Excellencies, distinguished delegates. I'm honored to be invited to address the 15th symposium of the ICAO Traveler Identification Program on behalf of the World Economic Forum. We value our long-standing partnership with ICAO and the opportunity to contribute to the efforts of the TRIP strategy. The World Economic Forum is the international organization for public-private cooperation. Having been in operation for five decades, the forum brings together world leaders from across the globe, including most influential CEOs and a large community of heads of states, for the purpose of catalyzing action to improve the state of the world. 
We do this through working at, a very, at the very edge of emerging technologies, anticipating what changes these technologies will unleash on society at large, and learning together with public and private stakeholders how to navigate these, cha these changes ensure, and ensure we use them for good rather than enabling harm. Additionally, because technology is evolving so rapidly, we work with regulators, policy makers, and with innovators in industry to design adaptable, agile governance frameworks for ensuring valuable use. In the aviation, travel, and tourism environment, we are seeing the proliferation of biometric technologies, the exploration of blockchain, and the accelerated use of machine learning. These technologies are being used in particular to try to address the mutual challenge of an unprecedented growth in global travel with the increasing constraints on physical infrastructure and border and security screening procedures. And this particular challenge, because of its sheer size and complexity, cannot be solved by independent actors alone. It requires cooperation among stakeholders and importantly across fields of expertise. The increasing number of travelers presents an enormous challenge for air borders. Current constraints on infrastructure, human and capital resources are likely to result in bottlenecks and strained operations in aviation and border security, thus increasing risks related to national security and soft targets. Recognizing that facilitating the secure movement of international travelers through airports is a priority for both nation states and industry partners, the forum has worked for the last few years with its stakeholders to identify mutually beneficial global interventions that would accelerate and our ability to address these challenges. This resulted in the conceptualization of the known traveler digital identity introduced eight months ago. The known tra traveler digital identity or KTDI concept recognizing, recognizes that there are a multitude of ongoing local pilots and programs that seek to deliver a seamless experience for the traveler in the airport journey. Airports like Sipol, Heathrow, and Dubai are radically improving the customer experience and optimizing efficiencies through the use of biometrics and joint pilots between airlines and airports, bringing life to the One ID concept popularized by IATA and the Seamless Traveler Journey Framework introduced by WTTC. To see these benefits recognized across the global traveler system, it is important that these systems talk to each other in a practical way and serve the needs of all stakeholders in the ecosystem. This means the framework for these to work together should address the unique needs of government agencies, not just industry. This includes border agencies, identity issuing agencies, and transport ministries, to name a few. It also means this global framework should be interoperable and usable across the entire value chain. It should be scalable, and it should be vendor agnostic, and it should be designed to bring valuable utility to hotels, car rentals, booking agents, and other stakeholders that build the travel and tourism experience for travelers. When I addressed this gathering in November at the last TRIP Symposium last year, I was proud to share that we had embarked on a pilot process with the governments of Canada, the Netherlands, and industry partners, KLM, Air Canada, the airports of Toronto, Montreal, and Amsterdam, and with the support of uh, technology partners such as Accenture, Vision Box, and Idemia in the two countries. Today, nine months later, we will officially launch the known traveler digital identity pilot consortium, a symbolic acknowledgement and formalization of a collection of public and private entities working together to, to build a cross-border example of using digital identities to enhance both security and seamlessness in the entire travel continuum. This is symbolic because we're learning rapidly across sectors that getting the full benefit 
out of user-centric, versatile digital identities, linking individuals to the services they require cannot be achieved by individual organizations. To support alignment across sectors, including international travel, the forum hosts the platform for good digital identity. For now 18 months, it has brought together public and private sector leaders from across industries, such as health, financial services, and travel, to, to define global principles for identity in a digital world and accelerate progress towards digital identity solution that bridge the physical digital divide in a manner that is inclusive, trustworthy, safe, and sustainable. What is critical in moving towards user-centric digital identities that serve both individuals and the organizations with which they interact is finding the right balance between usefulness, security, inclusivity, and the ability to design systems that are fit for purpose and offer choice for users. Working in the, in the known Traveler Digital Identity Consortium, we have recognized how important it is to strike this balance and hope to utilize the KTDI platform to scale, to provide learnings and recommendations to other stakeholders how to achieve this balance in a multi-stakeholder environment. We offer five core elements of good digital identity that will support a valuable transition. First, digital identities must be fit for purpose. This means they must be accurate, unique, acceptable, and sustainable. Accuracy and uniqueness has always been preserved in the travel environment by the trip strategy and identity management efforts of ICAO, and this ensures identities are trusted. The KTDI works based on a digital identity created and authenticated by the issuing government, such as digital travelers' credential, and having the individual identity attributes verified and cryptographically used using a decentralized public key infrastructure. Secondly, digital identities must be useful. This means they must offer access to a wide range of services and interactions and must be easy to establish and use. The KTDI has been co-designed by stakeholders across the travel continuum, including hotels, airlines, and financial services companies. It is testing a key innovation by enabling attestations or verified credentials from private entities on top of government-issued credentials. So a traveler can show verified proof of their visas, frequent flight numbers, driver's licenses, or hotel loyalty numbers. This ensures that we are testing the ability of digital identities to serve more than one use, such as border crossings. Using this utility and convenience allows governments and corporations to provide more personalized value-added services and encourages wide-spectrum adoption by individuals and organizations. Third, in a similar way, digital identities must offer choice. Increasingly, individuals are demanding control and transparency over their personal data. Regulators also are focusing more on privacy and data protection. Identity systems that meet these demands will likely boost trust, minimize the risk of exploitation or manipulation, and enjoy more widespread adoption. As a traveler-centric system, the KTDI allows the user to manage all components of their identity in a digital format and enables the consensual sharing of one or more identity attributes or to attestations on an authorized to know and need to know basis with the stakeholders in the KTDI ecosystem. To really move forwards this type of system, it is also critical to inform and educate users about their rights to privacy and data protection, and this should be embedded in the user experience design of any digital identities to empower individuals to make informed choices and decisions about their identity and privacy considering the trade-offs. Fourth, it goes without saying that digital identities must, must be thoroughly secure. ICAO standards and recommended practices ensure the current traveler identity system is as secure as possible. In the move to digital identities, the entire system should offer protection from authorized access 
um, disclosure sharing unauthorized access, disclosure sharing theft or manipulation of data. It should also embed an audit trail to assign responsibility and provide for recourse in the case of security breach. Fifth and lastly, the move from digital, from physical to digital system must be inclusive by design. Universal access and inclusion should be embedded into the design and facilitating the move to individualized risk assessments can go, go a long way to ensuring users are granted access to those services they are entitled to. The KTDI concept is envisioned for use by anyone who can obtain a digital identity that can be authenticated by the issuing government and who is legally allowed to travel. It was designed with minimum data requirements, meaning that only information that is critical for a given transaction to occur would be shared. This can safeguard against discrimination or unintended consequences of unauthorized sharing of personal data. A digital identity framework will be more inclusive if it has standards for ad identity data and for interaction with trust anchors that all individuals can meet. These five elements fit for purpose, usefulness, security, um, choice offering and inclusivity are interconnected and of equal importance. At the same time, tensions exist between them. But our KTDI pilot consortium is offering a ripe environment for learning and testing these tensions. For example, strong privacy measures will support security, but increased security may also re reduce convenience. Providing user value in digital identities thus requires solving challenges in all five elements, considering cultural, policy, and legal contexts. With digital identities to, that offer convenient trusted access along with user choice and control over their data, New digital identities will be more efficient and cost effective in the longer run than what exists in the data silos of today. Technologies and standards to enable decentralized identity system are rapidly gaining momentum. But most operating models and regulatory frameworks today are designed for centralized systems. New ecosystems for digital identity will need new governance models and stakeholder, multi-stakeholder collaboration will be crucial to test and define what these models will look like. As a KTDI pilot progresses in the coming year, the forum will continue to collaborate and share insights with all valued partners to inform the development of digital identity ecosystems and standards and encourage partnerships around best practices and interoperability. We encourage you to find more out more at ktdi.org and look forward to working alongside ICAO and other members to advance the transformation from physical to digital identity systems over the next decade. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup, Christophe. Thank you very much, Christophe, for this very interesting presentation. I was tempted to ask you to speak a little slower for the interpreters, but also not to speak too long uh, so that we can meet the time. But you did uh, stay within your time, and I think that the interpreters have been able to keep up, so there's no problem. So now we're going to give the floor to Simon Daignan, who uh, represents the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, the OSCE. He manages the... Uh, travel document security program, and he is going to tell you a story. Simon, Simon, it's over to you. Good morning, everyone. I will speak English, but with an Irish accent. Are you ready to go on a journey through time? Time travel? Yesterday, my director spoke about the four key areas that the OSC works on in traveler identification. Today, I want to focus just on one, biometrics. And I want to speak to you about the past, the present, and the future. In the past, 
I'll speak about where we got our mandate for dealing with biometrics. In the present, I'll speak about what we're actually doing, in particular regarding biometric passports and the ICAO public key directory. And for the future, I'll look at what we plan to do to help states to develop biometric systems for countering terrorism. But since we're starting in the past, let's start 140 years ago with a ghost story. Ooh. June 27th, 1879. A young Irish woman named Mary Gallagher. She was in Montreal, only a couple of blocks from here, on the corner of William Street and Murray Street. She was brutally murdered and beheaded. Now, why is this important? Still to this day, every seven years, she haunts the streets of Montreal, searching for her head searching for her face, her biometric identifier that will prove that she is who she says she is so she can travel into the next world. But because she's lost this, she continues to haunt the streets to this day, stuck between worlds. Now, why is this relevant for the OSC? Are we the Ghostbusters? No. However, we do help states to use and develop biometric technologies, including facial scans. So let's talk about the mandate. Why are we doing this? Who here has heard of UN Security Council Resolution 2396? Let's get a show of hands. Okay, good. Some of you, at least. I know Ruth is also going to be touching on this a little bit later. In terms of biometrics, there are two key mandates in this resolution. Firstly, it mandates all states, every single state that's here, to develop systems to collect and use biometric data for countering terrorism. That's a big ask. So secondly, the resolution tasks regional organizations like the OSC to provide technical assistance, resources, and capacity building to be able to help states meet their commitments. This resolution supplements many of the other resolutions dealing with travel document security as well as ICAO standards on identity management. So that's our mandate, which is built from our past resolutions. Let's look at the present. What are we actually doing now? And that deals with specifically biometric passport security and joining the ICAO public key directory. We heard from Christiane yesterday, but maybe we can do a brief summary again. Here is a diagram that I stole from someone else's presentation. And let's pretend that I'm the citizen down on the bottom left. I have my Irish biometric passport, which I got from the government. And because Ireland is a member of the ICAO PKD, that means I am a trusted traveler. When I travel, my biometric passport is treated as an e-passport, as a biometric passport. So Ireland is getting its money worth, money's worth for the investment it made in biometric passports. And let's say I'm traveling to Germany. Christoph here is from Germany. Germany is also a member of the ICAO PKD, which means when I travel there that Christoph can verify that the chip in my passport has not been altered or changed in any way. That's the tr chain of trust that's created by the ICAO Public Key Directory. But what are we actually doing to help states 
to join the RKO PKD. Can I take my passport back? Sure. Excellent. Well, I would break it up in three phases. Firstly, we arrange sub-regional workshops. This brings together travel document issuance authorities with travel document verification authorities. And usually we gather about five or six countries from a sub-region, and it's not just a, a talking shop. We speak about what is the RKO PKD, why it's beneficial to join, and actually draft a roadmap for how those countries can actually become members. Now, we have many technical experts here, so I guess you'll know that just because you guys may think it's a good idea or because technical experts may think it's a good idea to join doesn't necessarily mean that the decision makers will think it's a good idea. So as a follow-up, we then arrange country visits. The objective of these country visits are to meet with the minister or a decision maker in the country who can give us the green light to join the ICAO PKD. We're generally joined by the ICAO PKD officer, as well as technical PKD experts who help us to persuade the decision maker that it's politically beneficial to join the ICAO PKD. Once we get the green light, then we get to work. Then we give direct technical support to the country. This technical support is in adjusting perhaps their national PKI or helping them to integrate with the PKD. Is this phased approach successful? Well, as my director outlined yesterday at the opening, we have managed to raise the level of PKD membership in the OSC area from 13 when we first started, to now 34. In the last seven months alone, we've had a sub-regional workshop for Southeastern Europe, five follow-up country visits in each of those countries, and two of those countries have already signed the MOU, Croatia and Bosnia, with the others not far behind. So that's what we've been doing. Let's look at the future. In terms of the future for our PKD initiative, we want to move into the other sub-regions in the OSC area. Central Asia, the Caucasus, Eastern Europe. Try and grow the ICAO PKD membership. Additionally, we want to address the issue that Christian spoke about yesterday the PKD members who are not using the PKD in the way that they should. So we're also hoping to go out and meet those countries and show them how they should be using the PKD. But that's not all. In Resolution 2396, it calls on states to develop biometric systems for collecting and using biometric data for countering terrorism. So what does that mean? Here's another diagram that I stole from someone else. Collecting biometric data at the border means that when a traveler arrives at the border, such as this guy in the top left, that his biometric, a biometric scan is taken. Usually, this means a facial scan, but it can also mean fingerprints or, or maybe even an iris. If a country then collects this biometric scan, they can do two things. Firstly, they can verify that I am who my passport says I am, that my face matches the biometric chip in my passport. It also means the country can check my facial scan against watch lists or databases that they may have that contain biometric data such as Interpol's Foreign Terrorist Fighter Biometric Watch List. As we heard yesterday, states still have quite a long way to go in order to be able to meet their commitments in this resolution. So that's why 
we have launched a new initiative on biometrics. We launched it in April of this year, together with the Biometrics Institute. And our goal is to help states to meet their commitments in Resolution 2396. But how do we plan on doing this? We plan to follow the same three-phased approach that we used in the PKD project. Meaning, we plan to organize sub-regional workshops, which will bring together counter-terrorism officials, border officers, data privacy experts, explain to them what is biometrics, why they're beneficial for countering terrorism, and how those countries should go about developing those systems. Phase two, then, will be country visits. And not only will we be meeting with decision makers to help to persuade them to meet their commitments, but we'll also use these country visits as a needs assessment to figure out what systems the country has in place, where they want to go, and how the OSC can assist them. Once this is done, we'll move to phase three, which is our direct technical support. Helping these countries to maybe amend their legislation, procure hardware, procure software, integrate these biometric systems into their border management operations. Of course, we're not doing this in a vacuum. Because the UN adopted this far-reaching resolution, they've also published a UN compendium of recommended practices for the responsible use and sharing of biometrics and counterterrorism. We plan to use these recommended practices in our work with states. And we've partnered with one of the main authors of this compendium, that was the Biometrics Institute, to be able to help us do that. In summary, I have spoken to you about our mandate, which is built in the past. I've spoken to you about our present activities related to biometric passports and joining the LKL PKD. And I've spoken to you about our future plans for helping states to develop and use biometric systems for countering terrorism. We've already heard a lot in this symposium about the importance of partnership. And that's why we're here. If you are a country that already has biometric systems, and you can maybe help us to help others, please get in touch with me. Perhaps you are an international or regional organization with expertise in biometrics, and we can join in partnership to help states implement this resolution. If so, please get in touch with me. Or perhaps you are a private company or consultant working on biometrics, and we could work with you to send you into a, a country to deliver expert advice to that country to help them develop and build up their biometric systems. If so, please get in touch with me. I'll leave you one last note about our friend Mary Gallagher, the haunted ghost. She is due to reappear tomorrow, June 27th on the corner of William Street and Murray Street. She has been haunting the streets of Montreal now for 140 years. Never before have so many identity experts been gathered in Montreal at the same time that Mary Gallagher would reappear. So get out into the streets, help Mary Gallagher find her head, she can get her identity back. Thank you very much. My name is Simon Dagnan. It's a pleasure to be here. Merci beaucoup, Simon, pour... Thank you very much, Simon, for this very interesting historical perspective. 
And uh, thank you for telling us about the full uh, usage of these uh, documents and the, the importance of the uh, joining the PKD. So now we were going to move on to Ruth Kiragu, who is a program officer with the United Nations Office of Counterterrorism in New York. She's going to talk to us about her role in the implementation of the uh, countering terrorism ta travel program, which began this year. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Um, I'll begin my presentation by reflecting on uh, Security Council Resolution 2396, which uh, Simon has already referred to. So that resolution uh, created new obligations to strengthen border security and information sharing. And it also called upon member states to build their capability on API PNR, specifically for purposes of preventing the travel of foreign terrorist fighters. So the initiative that I'll be sharing with you today is the United Nations Countering Terrorist Travel Program. This is a multi-year global uh, capacity building initiative that we implement in partnership with uh, four other UN entities, CTED, ICAO, um, OICT, and UNODC. The purpose of this program is to support member states to enhance their capacity to detect foreign terrorist fighters and other serious criminals through the use of API and PNR data in compliance with Security Council Resolution 2396. This is a very new initiative uh, that was just only launched uh, in May in the presence of uh, the UN Security Council, I mean, uh, in the presence of the UN Secretary General and also their Chaos Secretary General. The end result of this uh, initiative is that member states should be able to have the capability to um, have API PNR data sent to them by air carriers through a single window. Uh, they should have the capability to be able to analyze and process that data and then share it uh, internally with competent authorities and also uh, with other member states for purposes of detecting, preventing, investigating terrorist travel. So, uh, the program initiates from uh, what we call CTED assessment. So CTED is mandated by the Security Council to assess the implementation of member states, uh, implementation of Security Council resolutions. So we undertake a very detailed analysis of uh, member states that are interested in receiving this uh, capability from the United Nations. And as a result, a very detailed implementation roadmap is developed that sets out um, tailored recommendations on how a member state can be able to build this capability. We usually encourage uh, member states to identify a lead ministry that will be the focal point for uh, ongoing uh, uh, liaison. Uh, the program foresees four key areas of implementation, uh, and I'll just go through each of them very briefly. The first is uh, legislative assistance. So this is led by our colleagues at UNODC. So we assist member states to develop their national legislative frameworks so that they can be able to regulate the collection, transmission, use retention and sharing of API and PNR data in compliance with international human rights uh, framework. We are also very pleased with the, very, uh, with the recent establishment of the special task force that has been uh, tasked to develop a new uh, standard on, a on PNR and the results of this uh, exercise will of course uh, inform our work on legislative assistance. The second uh, area that is foreseen is operational assistance, and this is uh, led by our colleagues at UNODC, but also our colleagues in New York at UNOCT. So here we are supporting member states to uh, develop uh, or to set up a sustainable passenger information unit 
This is the unit that is charged with collecting and processing API PNR data within uh, the member state framework. So we support in terms of developing the standard operating procedures, establishing the governance uh, elements, and also providing uh, a wide range of capacity building, including through training. Uh, the third is the air transport engagement, and this is led by our colleagues at ICAO. So beneficiary member states are supported to secure the provision of bulk API PNR data from airlines to their PIUs, their passenger information units, in accordance with ICAO standards and recommended practices. The third and final, the fourth and final uh, area of support is the provision of ICT uh, support. So we do support uh, member states with uh, a software system that allows them to be able to, to uh, collect and store and process API PNR data. We refer to this system as Go Travel, um, and we ensure that uh, the system is not only connected with the air carrier so that the passenger data can be uh, properly transmitted, but also we provide maintenance support uh, going forward so that uh, the system is able to operate in the way in which it is supposed to operate. Um, and that's the end of my, my presentation. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, Ruth. Thank you very much, Ruth. Now we will give the floor to Florian Forster who is from the International Organization for Migration. It's an organization that works on the ground that implements the, the elements we've discussed, and he has a particularly interesting presentation. Thank you, Florian. The floor is yours. Hello, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much uh, to IKO for inviting IOM to attend also the 2019 symposium on TRIP. It's a very important program and I want to uh, today focus a bit on innovations uh, we see in the border management field related to TRIP. Innovations that are not always technical or high technical, but also innovations that uh, are useful for settings in challenging situations, not only at air borders, also at sea or land borders. Um, before I go to uh, the presentation, let me say a couple of words about uh, IOM and uh, IOM's work in the field of immigration and border management. <coughs> IOM is the United Nations Migration Agency. We have now 173 member states. As uh, Mr. Sylvain said, we are focused uh, on uh, policy on the one hand side, but also very strongly on project implementation, project development around the world, around the globe. So it's a very technical uh, and hands-on organization. We are not setting standards. That's not the mandate we got from our member states, but we are there to support countries, to provide advice and to provide services and technical assistance. Uh, in the migration management field at large, and then specifically also related to border management, identity management. So the focus is uh, uh, on the policy debate, on the program development and implementation. I think we have, uh, I've now worked since, with IOM since 24 years, we have uh, gained uh, a solid reputation to implement, to be able to implement large scale uh, capacity building technical assistance project around the world and uh, that not only in Europe or in Northern America but also in more challenging settings uh, around the world. We work in uh, countries like today Libya or Somalia, Afghanistan, South Sudan, uh, uh, often in situations where we have particular challenges and uh, where we still want to do our very best to support government to uh, live up to uh, their obligations and uh, to ensure that uh, border management helps and uh, functions properly. The um, scale of IOM's total program is now around 1.8 billion. It's largely 
donor funded from the member states. Uh, the biggest uh, donors are the European Union and the 28 member states, uh, plus uh, associated countries followed by the United States, Japan, and so the classic donor community. Um, we have today around uh, 13,000 colleagues based in 150 uh, countries, uh, roughly 400 field locations around the world. And I think that shows a bit the strength of IOM in helping to implement activities uh, uh, across the globe also in these more challenging situations. In the specific field of order management, immigration, identity management, which I'm overseeing at IOM, we had last year 250 projects uh, with a total expenditure of 124 million, to give you a rough idea how much uh, uh, of the scope of our activities. Um, when we talk about innovations, I mean, it's the, the technical side, but I think what is also important is that we look at the policy frameworks around it and uh, uh, to make sure that they are coherent, that uh, what we do within the TRIP program also is reflected properly within other uh, uh, policy frameworks. And I just want to mention a couple here, which I think are relevant. I could also mention the Sustainable Development Goals. I didn't list them here specifically, uh, but this is very important. So all the work we do under the TRIP program fits very, very well with uh, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. It also fits, and that's a bit more recent, with the Global Compact for Migration, the GCM which was uh, um, welcomed by uh, the large majority of UN member states uh, in uh, December last year. And I just want to uh, highlight here three of the uh, objectives within the GCM, which deal specifically also with elements that are uh, covered by the TRIP. Objective four, to ensure that all migrants have proof of legal identity and adequate uh, documentation. Objective 11, to manage borders in an integrated, secure, and coordinated manner. And objective 23, which also was raised a couple of times, the need for close cooperation and international cooperation and partnership in this field. I also mention here uh, in the last line a couple of other new initiatives where IOM is strongly engaged. The UNLIEG, Legal Identity Experts Working Group. Uh, so the United Nations now look at uh, legal identity issues. The TRIP framework, again, there plays a big role, but it goes beyond travelers. It goes to birth registration. Uh, it uh, looks at legal identity as a tool to participate in your own country, to um, fully make your rights uh, um, respected. So that's important. We have, of course, the ID4D, the World Bank Initiative, where IOM is also a partner with. And we, I think we have a presentation of this uh, later. And also, just to mention the new strategic vision, which is currently developed by IOM and uh, shared, has been shared with the member states, where we have put much more focus, again, on legal identity, EID, uh, as a, a very important and uh, uh, key tool for proper migration and border management. So innovation, not just on the technical side, but also when it comes to the policy frameworks around that. So what do we do at IOM, specifically in the uh, field of border management, identity management, and uh, TRIP? Uh, we have signed in 2016 uh, an MOU with ICAO, which structures our cooperation. Uh, and uh, TRIP is one of the key elements of this cooperation. We have also health, uh, for instance, travel international and health, which are also important areas, uh, especially now when we deal with challenges such as Ebola. Uh, and uh, uh, so we have also other elements there, but TRIP is certainly one of the uh, big elements within the cooperation between IOM and ICAO. Um, I said this before, ICAO focuses on setting standards. Member states come together under ICAO to agree on standards and recommended practices. Our role then is to uh, use our implementation capacity to roll, to help governments uh, across the world, especially in developing countries or, or crisis countries, to roll them out. So the idea is to link this capacity to uh, um, 
ICAO's um, role and mandate to develop standards with the capacity to help countries rolling it out. For this, we have developed an action plan for implementation, which was presented at TAC uh, TRIP 2 uh, last year. And uh, we work in this field closely together with the working groups of uh, uh, TRIP, that means the New Technology Working Group, and especially the Implementation and Capacity Building Working Group, which has the role to support countries implementing and building the necessary capacity to implement the TRIP program. Uh, in this action plan I've mentioned before, and I will not go into all the details, we have identified some areas which are uh, Important. I just want to show you here again uh, the so-called trip bagel, the different areas of cooperation we're working in. We, we, we felt we have to help in all these five areas, on evidence of identity, machine readable travel documents, up to interoperable applications, but that we have to focus and concentrate on some of the areas. So we developed this uh, implementation plan where we have highlighted or especially focused on a, a couple of uh, topics uh, we are now focusing on. One is supporting governments in EM EMRTD or MRTD procurement, how to uh, get out a proper tender, to get how to write the specifications in your tender so that in the end you get uh, the, the document, the solution that is best suited for your needs. We work on the evidence of identity part on border management information systems, the control part, where the UN has also its own uh, um, uh, program available for member states, MIDAS, on PKI and PKD, where we have signed also recently an MOU with Luxembourg to support member states really understanding and, and then helping to roll out those systems. Um, uh, capacity building for border management officials, uh, whether it's travel document uh, uh, verification, examination, where we work together with ICAO, uh, or also uh, border management in crisis situations. For this, uh, especially on the African continent, we have a dedicated training center, the African Capacity Building Center on Border and Migration Management in Tanzania, Moshi, at the foot of Mount Kilimanjaro. Border assessments. Uh, that we do also together with partners, where then we look at the situation and uh, help countries to identify gaps and needs where assistance would be needed. Uh, increasingly also on uh, travel documents in emergency and crisis uh, uh, environments, together with ICRC, HCR, so there are many partners, how to issue proper documentation for people who cannot follow the normal process but who need a uh, documentation in a specific situation. Now one of the challenges we are working on is what to do with the Venezuelan crisis and how to help people to get legal identity you know, or to be at least registered and to legally exist in neighboring countries who uh, welcome the people to go there. And on API, on API I have my colleague uh, Eric Slavenas who will talk about this more tomorrow. I want to uh, show you also, uh, uh, my time is limited, so, you know, a couple of examples of what we do in the control. Uh, when you look to the trip bagel, border control element, we have uh, uh, our own IT system that we make available to interested member states. Member states also get the source code of this uh, 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 program and it's called MIDAS, Migration Information and Data Analysis System, which uh, we have now rolled out in 22 countries. Uh, all the countries that are interested can have it. It's highly custom, customizable. That means it's not just an entry-exit system, but it can be also customized uh, for uh, specific other, for instance, registration solutions or challenges which need to be addressed. Uh, today we have it in 22 states. I've listed them here uh, in, how, in around uh, 20, 130 um, border points not just air but especially also land or sea. What I wanted to say here as well is uh, we look uh, currently also at uh, cooperation with ASICUDA. Those who work on customs uh, are familiar with that. It's the United Nations IT system made available for member states on customs management. We deal with human beings, ASICUDA more with containers if you want. And uh, we soon, we are now currently negotiating, soon going to sign an agreement 
to then support states to, who want to have the two systems so that they can interact and exchange information. Important, uh, this uh, system MIDAS, all the information is exclusively with the national authorities, so the UN doesn't retain any of this information. All the information is exclusively with the responsible national authorities. Also, and just one more example uh, linked to MIDAS, how we can integrate uh, this with uh, interoperable, situ uh, interoperable applications. Uh, so whenever we help setting up a border management information system, be it MIDAS, be it also other systems, we also help countries to help, uh, you know, if they choose another system to, to implement that system, we can link it to these interoperable applications like the Interpol SLTD uh, solution. Uh, uh, work on API, we hear more about this tomorrow, to the PKD, um, uh, also verification with national databases, so very customizable solutions that are specifically requested by the member state for the specific situation. So uh, I would like to come to an end with my presentation and uh, trying to reach out to the member states, ICAO member states are also IOM's member states. When you have uh, needs and so please reach out to us. Uh, the more we know about your challenges, the better we can respond to them. Uh, and normally we respond to them by doing an assessment together with you. The results are, of course, kept confidential if the government wants. And then based on this assessment, we can write a proposal, project proposal, go fundraising, and try to help implementing then the solutions identified. The best, uh, we do this also not in isolation, we do this together with other countries. With IKEA we did an assessment in uh, St. Lucia, for instance. So it's, it's important that we have the exchange and that we also but then identify what are the specific needs and then try to work out a concrete solution which then could be implemented with specific donor funding. So please contact your IOM mission in your own capital. I think uh, IOM is in most of the countries present or then in the regional offices. I also give you here the names of uh, our regional thematic specialists, uh, all specialists in the field of border management that are around the globe or of course IOM headquarters in Geneva that can be contacted. I want to come and, and end with that. I think it's, it's very important that when we uh, look at uh, border management that we uh, look not just at the security side, it's a very important element. It's now, of course, often in the forefront, also media, but that we look also at the facilitation side. Let's not forget that most of the travelers that cross borders do this in a bona fide manner. So we also try to work a lot on facilitation, and not just facilitation, but also development. Borders should also be areas where uh, international or economic development of countries is boosted. I think that's a very important element that we look at this. And uh, when we look at border management, we also have maybe a third element, uh, which we as IOM see specifically as well. It's the protection side. Proper border management, proper identity management is there to facilitate, to ensure security, but also protect the vulnerable people single children, uh, asylum seekers, refugees. We have to have the three elements together. And I think what I want to leave now with uh, is the idea that when we think about identity management, border management, that we always consider these three aspects. Uh, they, are, they are equally important. And uh, it's, it's important that we uh, put them in the right relationship. Uh, and. Uh, especially when we come from a development perspective as well, it's important to stress the development and the facilitation element of good border management, good identity management. There's so much in it, and that goes hand in hand with the security and, and counterterrorism elements. I leave you with that. Thanks a lot, and I'm happy for further discussions later. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Florian. Uh, well, je vais continuer en français. Well, I'll continue in French. Thank you very much, Florian. And uh, thank you to all four of you for your very interesting presentations. Now we have about a quarter of an hour left to us so we can uh, start the discussion. I have received uh, some interesting questions from the room. So if you would like to ask any questions, so you have the address. It's tripsymposium at ikeo.int. It's all together, 
as you see on the screen. I have a few questions myself. And since I am holding the mic, I'm going to jump in first. I have a question, first of all, that could be taken by Christoph, but others uh, might want to add something as well. It's on something that was mentioned in the uh, World Economic Forum's uh, approach and uh, the uh, elements, uh, the security of the system and the options, the ability to choose. Everyone knows that not everybody is uh, tech savvy. Not everybody wants to uh, give their biometric data to an operator that they don't necessarily trust. So there's the uh, issue of trust. And uh, to achieve trust, you need uh, information and uh, the ability to assess the information. And that's uh, not easy when you have such a complex, sophisticated technology. And we've seen in uh, the data breaches and uh, information theft that uh, personal data are a gold mine for operators uh, and uh, social media. So how can we build trust in operators, uh, systems, and the technologies so that the general public will turn to these systems and participate in the uh, development of this kind of facilitation? Mm, yeah, thank you very much for, for this question. Uh, this uh, touches the important areas of privacy, of uh, indeed of confidence of, um, of travelers uh, that uh, cross borders. Um, if I can just um, make a recourse on, on the presentation on, on the known um, traveler digital identity. So the, I think the one of the differentiating factors is that this um, system, which is a scalable system, has been designed with, with a traveler in the center and with privacy by design. Um, and we, th we think is if, if this um, wasn't the case, sooner or later, I mean, it would hit roadblocks down the road in, in consumer and customer acceptance. And um, it is basically, the logic is you would, um, you can, uh, it doesn't work with a centralized database, but it basically works, uh, uh, the design is decentralized, uh, blockchain based, and you would as a traveler only, as, a, as an individual only give so, uh, those informations uh, that are really needed for your, um, for your travel. So you basically, if you, it's, it's basically at the end of the day, it's an app and you would, uh, uh, make, can make choices along the, your, your travel, which information you're willing to give. Obviously, I mean, for border crossing, for security, um, um, I mean, uh, information are necessary, are demanded. So if you're not willing to give them, then you don't travel. Yeah? So, but, uh, uh, but basically, it's, uh, it's the, the, the logic is you release uh, information which is stored um, to third parties uh, on your by your by by choice, um, and um, I think a second a second important one is obviously uh, these systems need to be have a value need to be usable, and uh, the other design criteria is scalability. So we think that for these seamless travel journey um, um, systems, as have been you know suggested by WTC and by by IATA, et cetera. So you need, uh, you, it, it won't be feasible if basically uh, at an airport, if you go for each destination, you have a different, basically a different software, a different system to, to and it's only, also it won't be feasible for airports. So you need to have scalability and then it, consumer acceptance comes with it because you know it's not just one global entry program, but you could potentially use that type of thing for going from, from any uh, destination to any destination. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much, Christophe. I have a question for Ruth from Stephen Grant. And uh, I could probably answer it myself. Uh, but, uh, Mr. Stephen Grant, uh, what is the division of responsibilities between UN CITED and UN OCT? Uh, thank you very much for that question. So 
both UNOCT and CTED are based in New York, but our mandate is different. So UNOCT gets its mandate from the General Assembly, and CTED gets its mandate from the Security Council. So in the program that I just uh, described, the role of UNOCT is uh, we are the ones who lead uh, the program implementation. So we are the ones responsible for the coordination and uh, also resource mobilization. But CTED is a very key partner because um, they are the ones who inform which countries receive uh, assistance through this program. So as I had said earlier, CTED is mandated by the Security Council to assess how well member states are implementing Security Council resolutions that pertain to counterterrorism. So in the context of API and PNR, CTED will undertake an assessment and identify the needs and the gaps uh, that a member state uh, has and then uh, identify the best technical assistance capacity building entities that can be able to provide this support. And then it is on that basis that we as the UN uh, provide the assistance that is required. I hope that's okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ruth. Um, question uh, to the implementing uh, entities, OSC and IOM. Um, when we, when we talk about innovation, uh, we are talking about new technologies, very sophisticated things, but uh, on, on the ground, how does it work with all these new techs uh, when you are on the border, in the middle of the desert, uh, without uh, correct uh, power supply, without uh, internet or network? How can all this uh, be uh, implemented uh, in the field? Great question. And I think as you, as you heard yesterday when my director was speaking, there is a, a huge gap, a huge divide that, that we're trying to bridge here. And last year actually in a, when I gave a presentation I was speaking about the importance of capacity building and I included a, a picture actually of a border crossing point that I had recently visited in, in uh, Central Asia. And that border crossing point had no passport readers, no power, and obviously no electricity then either. But the country did have an e-passport. So you wonder what's the, what's the benefit of an e-passport to someone traveling through that particular boarding crossing point. So how do we deal with it? At least the focus that we have been doing when it comes to API PNR is focused primarily on aviation. Um, and trying to get the, the airport uh, systems up, up and running. Um, when it comes to then passport security, again, it deals with uh, more, more of their, their overall passport security and identity management systems. But yeah, it, it's a definitely a, a massive issue. Um, I think IOM are more on the ground dealing with some of the, the more difficult issues in, in terms of border crossing points and implementing their, their MIDAS system. So perhaps, uh, Florian, you can uh, take over. Thanks. Yeah, I think it's really a challenge uh, how to work in many countries, and we don't only talk about air borders, but there's mainly also land borders. So maybe first the call is also uh, to, to the private sector. Uh, we have a lot of uh, industry representatives uh, present in Montreal as well now today to really think about also innovation in this field. You know, what, what, what kind of innovation, not only think about the high-tech innovations for Japan, Europe, uh, Korea or North America, but also what, what are very practical innovations that could work uh, in a specific uh, challenging setting. And I think there's, there are probably also many more technical innovations available and uh, we would be very interesting interested to hear about this and I think uh, uh, TAC is also interested to hear more or learn more about uh, thinking and the developments in this field. I mean, what, what we then do is, uh, I'll give you the example of Niger where we have big programs uh, uh, working on mobile border posts when it comes to the northern border with, uh, uh, with Libya. There are particular challenges as well because uh, migrants uh, get lost in the desert. We don't know how many migrants die in the desert, but you know you can uh, surely assume that uh, uh, when people die in the Mediterranean Sea, many also die in the desert. Uh, so that's a real human tragedy. One has to work on that, and there the role of border guards is as well to rescue uh, 
uh, people who otherwise would die, but also to bring in uh, uh, a certain order and to, to make sure that people legally exist. And uh, I think you know, those are then solutions we are trying to work on with mobile posts on a truck, huh? with uh, registration solutions which operate uh, uh, fairly independently and which can then also be uh, put to the place where there's the most need in the specific situation. Uh, so I think you know, those are some of the elements. Otherwise, having systems in place that are resilient, robust, uh, uh, you, cannot have interconnect you cannot have connectivity all the time, but that doesn't mean that you cannot have maybe an update with your, with your USB stick or with a CD-ROM uh, every week, which is better than having nothing. Uh, I think those are solutions we then have to work on. And then, um, uh, but I think that more technical innovations in this field, we see that now satellite communication is getting cheaper, is, is much more affordable, uh, getting more affordable. So those are also solutions linked to that that could work well. Uh, and, uh, but let, let us remember that this is really where uh, a lot of the needs are today. When we open the media, this is what uh, media articles or the TV talks about and uh, solutions have to be found in that field. So we work on this, but we also look to the private sector, to other partner organizations to come with solutions, what could be done in that field. Merci. Thank you. Thank you to both of you for uh, that clarification. That reminds me that one of the uh, flagship uh, initiatives of IKEA was the No Country Left Behind uh, initiative and uh, the standards and projects uh, developed to here are for 193 member states. So we have to be aware that innovation is necessary, certainly, but it uh, has to apply to all of the member countries of ICAO in some way or another. Now I have some uh, highly technical questions, so I'm going to uh, put them to my panelists. A question for Simon, but I don't know if uh, he's the best place to answer. In the regulatory issue in using blockchain in identity management system, and can a, an identity management system work without a central database? You're right that I'm not the person to answer that. <laughs> <laughs> I think the, uh, the, the um, misunderstanding often with blockchain technology is the, the, the data, the in individual data are not on the blockchain. Yeah, so this is actually the but the blockchain w works with a system of pointers, so uh, the, the identity the identity data stay in the in the repositories, uh, and I think that's that's probably the because there's a there's a fear that blockchains are the next kind of hackable um, 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 basically entity and of security and safety. Yeah, so I think the the easy answer without going to all kind of technical details is. Uh, the data are not on the blockchain, so it's basically a system of pointers that points then to the right uh, to the right place to find those. Merci, merci. Thank you, Christoph. On the subject of blockchains, I'm not a specialist on this, but I read that uh, the registration or validation of uh, data set on blockchain uh, takes a lot of energy. You have to use a voting system on a number of different servers, and the more servers you have, the more ro robust the system is, but to the more energy it consumes. What can you tell us about that? Okay, now I'm getting all the blockchain questions. Um, and I, and I, I don't pretend to be a, a deep blockchain uh, um, expert. I think th I heard the same in the context of crypt, uh, cryptocurrencies. Yeah, so that basically you um, 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 deploying the system of bitcoins, basically because there's so much data mining, um, does um, does uh, cause a lot of um, basic energy consumption. Um, my, my sense, this is. I mean, this this this. I mean, there's, there's obviously a trade-off, but there's a lot of innovation happening that the, uh, basically the use of, uh, 
of, uh, of blockchain, which is a decentralized system and you know have a lot of transactions going back and forth on each entry on the blockchain, gets less data, uh, um, um, less, uh, uh, gets less energy uh, intensive. Yeah, so I don't, can't, I don't have particular numbers there. But um, I think the evidence on the ground is the blockchain is used for many things, for traceability, uh, for basically uh, we, we work as a, a World Economic Forum on the use of blockchain. For example, if you uh, source batteries from countries and the question is where does the lithium cobalt etc come from and are the the price uh, the, the the practices underneath in mining and metals are they are um, are they basically transparent and um, in in line with um, uh, human protection issues so so this can can be used for many things and it is being used for many things so it's actually an increasing amount of uh, um, um, uh, um, use cases on there, very uh, very popular ones, and it has a unique uh, advantage. And I think the uh, the question of uh, energy consumption of that is going to be to be to be solved increasingly. Merci, merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. I see that we're nearing the end of this uh, part of the morning session, but before we're leaving. I have a more general question on the role of international organizations, in particular ICAO, in introducing the conditions uh, for innovation to happen. There are a lot of uh, industries uh, that are making very interesting presentations. I think there are 53 different initiatives out there. That's what was said yesterday. On. Uh, uh, digitalization of travel documents, and uh, there's, the industry is uh, really gathering pace and uh, going fast. And on the other hand, there is a need for standardization so that it can all uh, dovetail and work together and to make sure that uh, the passenger doesn't have to wonder what system he they're registered in and uh, how uh, their smartphone is being used when they cross a border and uh, getting to the hotel. So all of this is uh, supposed to make us uh, safer, more secure. It's uh, intended to facilitate passenger throughput and make it all seamless. How do you think ICAO, and I'm asking all four of you, and uh, I'm going to ask the next panel this too so they can get ready. How do you, what do you think Akeo's role is in, on the one hand, uh, helping uh, to drive these innovations and on the other hand to ensure the necessary standardization to make sure it all works? Qui, qui, qui se <laughs> Who wants to take the plunge? <coughs> Oui, pardon. Uh, avant. Yes, sorry. Uh, first, we have to let Christophe go. He really does have to get away and get to the airport for the uh, uh, inauguration. So thank you very much for coming and participating, and see you again very soon. That was a good way of getting out of answering that question, Christophe. <laughs> well done. So he asked two things. One was about yeah, connecting with the, the countries and one about with private sector. I guess the, the existing working groups that, that are set up, I think, are, are an excellent way of doing that, whether it's the New Technologies Working Group, which brings together uh, actors from uh, the private sector, uh, academia, or the different countries, um, as well as then the Implementation and Capacity Building Working Group. Um, which, of course, looks at some of the, the needs of countries and how donors can provide those needs and builds up then uh, these recommendations to the, the, the TAG. Um, I think that perhaps these working groups can be further expanded, uh, maybe to try and involve more actors in it, try and get more input from, from other organizations, other countries, um, other uh, private sector actors as well. And the more input that you can get, then you can feed that up to the, to the TAG and um, whether that's uh, issues related to new technologies or, or capacity building. I think that ICAO is doing a good job bringing us all together. 
um, but these working groups uh, and, and these working groups are, are uh, certainly doing excellent work and, and uh, that can uh, be expanded even further. Um, I agree with Simon that um, I think ICAO has a very big role to play in terms of bringing the different stakeholders together. So, like for example, the ones who are reflected in uh, today's symposium, but also through the working groups and the other different uh, forums and events that you convene and uh, encourage how to bring these uh, different innovations further. Yeah, I also want to recommend the work of the working groups. I'm also a member of the working groups. I think it's important that uh, also member states from Africa, from Latin America, uh, consider participating. I think it's open for everybody, for every member state, and it's very important to have your voice heard and to be active in there. I think that will help a lot, you know, and also make sure that uh, the work goes into the direction which, is, which uh, meets your needs. So I think that's important. Another field is, uh, uh, I just want to mention, uh, of course we have you know, the more standardized international travel documents, uh, and there we need standardization, uh, global standardization, otherwise they're not acceptable. We see a lot of solutions now also more on the national level, sometimes on a bilateral level with border cards, you know, to facilitate cross-border trade, cross-border uh, uh, exchange uh, of border communities uh, to facilitate that. So, I mean, that's also a field where we have much less standardization, where governments can work uh, together or then also within their own territory alone, where we have less need for standardization, where there's also room for innovation. And uh, uh, but thirdly, and the last element, you know, what we at IOM try to do is we try to embrace the responsible use of biometrics, the responsible use of new technology. Uh, and not to say, oh, this is something only for the developed countries. No, that's something for every country in the world. Every country in the world has the right to use, to try these new technologies, to be, uh, to be a fraud, become a front runner. We see uh, countries in Africa, like Rwanda, very innovative, very much at, uh, ahead of, of, of other countries. And I think this is something we want to embrace, the responsible use of new technologies and to create openness for that and to also show the development potential of, of those new technologies. Merci, merci. Thank you to all three of you and also uh, Christophe who had to leave. Now I say let's uh, stop here because now we'll have the coffee break. And so I will give the floor to Denis, the Master of Ceremonies. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much, Sylvain. Thank you to our panels for some particularly timely and pertinent presentations this morning. Very well done on the part of the four presenters. And I'd like to thank the panel members for keeping to time. I really like people who who respect the time allotted because it provided us time for a very stimulating question period. So again, thank you for that as well. I think it's a good model for those listening for the rest of the symposium. So thank you. Yes, we will have the coffee break in just a few moments, sponsored by Canadian Banknote Company. And again, if any of you have questions about live streaming, the app, or any other question, our team is down here to help you. So don't hesitate to come and see us. We'd be happy to help. Enjoy the coffee break. Mingle, fifth floor, this floor, third floor. We'll see you back at 11. Thank you so much. <laughs>